Hi, John. Hello, Bob. How nice to see you uh, sort of in person, face to face, whatever. Good good to see you. Uh, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Jonathan Haidt, a psychologist at NYU. I guess it's a business school there, uh, mm-hmm. more specifically. Um, author of some well-known books, including The Righteous Mind, and your co-author with Greg Lukianoff of uh, The Coddling of the American Mind, big bestseller. Um, and that started as a story in The Atlantic, and you've recently written another piece in The Atlantic that got a lot of attention, and that's largely what we're going to talk about today. It's called Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. Uh, that almost understates how dismal the, the picture you paint is, I, I would say. That's almost too yes. lighthearted for the, <laughs> for the piece itself. Um, let, me, let me quote a little. You use a, you use a Tower of Babel uh, metaphor. I think reasonably enough. Uh, you write the story of Babel is the best metaphor I have found for what happened to America in the 2010s and for the fractured country we now inhabit. I should add, of course, in the story of Babel, you know, people who previously spoke the, lang- the same language uh, no longer do uh, by virtue of God's punishment for their uh, hubris. Um, then you write, something went terribly wrong. Very suddenly, we are disoriented, unable to speak the same language or recognize the same truth. We are cut off from one another and from the past. You go on that Babel is, quote, a story about the fragmentation of everything. It's about the shattering of all that had seemed solid, the scattering of people who had been a community. It's a metaphor for what is happening not only between red and blue, but within the left and within the right, as well as within universities, companies, professionals, associate, uh, professional associations, museums, and even families. After Babel, you're getting pretty intense here. After Babel, nothing really means anything anymore, at least not in a way that is durable and on which people widely agree. And I read this and I thought, God, even I am not quite this pessimistic. So maybe I should write a piece, which I did in my newsletter, non-zero newsletter. And that led you to, which you generously circulated on Twitter, that led to an interaction on Twitter that led to this. Mm -hmm. Um, So here we are. Here Uh, we are. And actually, you know what? I think we should also start by giving the readers the backstory to our relationship. Okay. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, so I started graduate school in 1987 at the University of Pennsylvania, and this was the period when evolutionary psychology was kind of just beginning to get going again after sociobiology had been a contentious thing in the 70s. Um, and among the people I read in graduate school, and then uh, um, I, I guess it was what, 1994, the, the Moral Animal? Was the Moral year. Animal, yeah. Yeah, so that was um, during my postdoc at the University of Chicago. But that book was very influential on me as I was reading other um um, other evolutionary psychologists, and also I'll say that that book, uh, both of your books, both that and the uh, uh, and Non-Zero, were influential on me when I wrote the Happiness Hypothesis, which was my first book, because you know as an academic, I wanted to write in a way that would be entertaining, that would be fun to read, and so I pulled down Richard Dawkins, Steve Pinker, you, um, one or two others, uh, Alain de Botton, just a few writers that I admired, and I think something I got from you is you. You would op- you often open your chapters with like a little trick. There'd be like a, a clever thing at the beginning. I'm going to take that start as a compliment. Tell the story. Uh, no, it was no, it <laughs> totally was. I totally copied what you did, um, and uh, so I just want to thank you for writing the moral animal and for being a great writer who helped me to be a better writer of of books for the popular audience, not academic books. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you. I remember in uh, the happiness hypothesis, I think it was that you you quoted my uh, a line of mine. Uh, mm-hmm. From the moral animal, the mind your mind is uh, more like a lawyer. It, 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 you know, it's not interested in what the actual truth is. Its job is to defend, uh, to find facts that seem to defend the, mm-hmm. the case you want to make, or something like that. Right. Um, so I quoted something. You had something like the human being is an animal splendid in its array of you know tools and weapons for deception and pathetic <laughs> in its ignorance and of, of you know. So you know it was. Uh, you know, you can say that my article is fit over the top, uh, but you know. No, uh, the, but, the truth is, I don't disagree that much with your article. I'm sad to say, I wish I could bring the world better news and say that I have the yeah. um, uh, a magic cure to the ills that you enumerate. Um, I, I mean, part of my motivation for writing was actually you did generously mention my book Non-Zero mm-hmm. in your piece, uh, as others have done. You used it as kind of iconic. Uh, of you know an, an optimistic worldview, a, 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 
a view that was optimistic about what information technology would do for us and, and its kind of unit of power. And I, I've always thought the book I met, you know, everyone took it as very optimistic. I've always thought it was less optimistic, uh, it was meant as partly as a warning that we were going through perilous times, but things could work out well. Um, and I also did emphasize uh, the divide. Well, the potential of information technology to fragment, to to facilitate the the formation of ever narrower tribes, uh, but then I talked about how that could ultimately be reconciled with, um, you know, with with unity, co social coherence, and and so yeah. on. So well, I was well, partly right. wanted to, uh, you know, it, it was uh, frankly a book promotional opportunity for one thing, um, but uh, yeah. but anyway, the. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, but, 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 but this is the perfect setup for, for what, what I think we should best talk about here, which is what I remember, what I always remember from, uh, from that book, what really shaped me is your repeated injunctions to step back and look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. That, you know, yes, you know, there's, you know, there's ups and downs. And World War II was a huge, it was you know, an enormous down, the Holocaust and the Cold War. Um, but if you step back far enough, and you go back, and, and of course, you know, if you go back to, you know, uh, bacteria, and you look at the long <laughs> trajectory of biological evolution towards higher cooperation, you see it in human evolution. Um, so that the image of, you know, the general trend is up, but there are some setbacks. And, and I think we both fully agree that if you have a major change in communication technology, like the printing press or radio and TV, there are going to be growing pains and things could get ugly. Um, but the question is, is this just another growing pain? Like, is it like TV, which of course did some bad things, but overall, you know, uh, didn't destroy democracy. And in fact, actually it helped spread democracy in some ways. So is it like TV or is it a dip and a rise more like the printing press, which was much more disruptive and led to, you know, a hundred years of war and what a third of the, a third of Germany mm -hmm. killed. I mean, so, or it, this could be a major one like the printing press where we're not going to get through this in 10 or 20 years. It could be 50 or hundred years before we get through to some future democracy, which is made better because of digital mm -hmm. technology. I don't doubt that there is a future that is better because of digital technology. So that's the second option, that this is like the printing press. The third option is that this is not like the printing press. This is something that goes down so deep into the operating system of human relationships and cognition that we're not going to get out of it, that um, we're not going to be able to cooperate ever again. Um, now, I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that's what I'm predicting. I'm not predicting that. But I think that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most likely thing is that this is like the printing press and 50 or 100 years from now, things will be a lot better. But in the next 10 years, they're not going to be. What do you think of those three options? Well, what do you I'd say, um, I mean, first of all, there, there's a sense in which the printing press is, it's kind of the opposite of TV. What I'd compare TV to is the invention of writing. Okay, so a new technology comes along and when new technologies like that, just qualitatively new communications technologies come along, they often consolidate and centralize power, right? Because okay. you got to be a big, powerful entity to have a TV station. There were only, when I grew up, there were only three networks. And right. we were still in that stage where, you know, so kind of elites, TV was a mechanism for elites kind of promulgating their con a, a consensus. Uh, mm -hmm. and just as kind of writing had given power to a priestly class and 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 was mm -hmm. used by kings to consolidate power. Now, with the printing press, writing filtered down more and more to the masses. It, it got at least mm -hmm. as far as Martin Luther, and it gave Martin Luther an opportunity to do something that previously only the Pope could do, which was distribute a piece of writing uh, in large numbers Widely. across a broad landscape. And <clears throat> so I would say if you look at video alone— we're in the printing press phase of video. In other words, a, a, a technology previously monopolized by elites mm. uh, has, 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 has decentralized power in okay, a certain way point. by filtering down. But one difference between the two is just how fast things are happening, right? I mean, the printing press, it took so long to play out. I mean, it was, it was key to the Reformation, but the Reformation didn't happen until like 70 years after the invention of the printing press. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we, you and I have seen, uh, I mean, first of all, I think we're seeing more thresholds appear more rapidly. I mean, I remember when the PC itself, without a modem, just a personal computer was a revolution. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, the modem, the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, social media, all of these things are dramatic and they're happening fast. And I guess the good news is maybe the recovery will be faster. You know, you did a funny tweet. I thought, I didn't know if it was intentionally funny. It was a little edgy. I don't know if you remember, but my my piece, you said, oh, uh, you know, you cited my piece and my newsletter said, excellent reply to my piece. I agree with Bob that uh, our troubles may be over in another couple of centuries or something like that. Because, yeah. <laughs> because yes. I, I had really zoomed in on the printing press as an analogy and acknowledged that you had to go through decades and decades and decades, the wars yeah. of religion and everything else before things kind of settled out. But, but it could, so it could be that things, uh, the disruption happens sooner and the, and the adaptation happens sooner. That's conceivable. But I've got to say, we're being hit with a lot really fast. And That's it's right. it's like the very texture of being human is changing. And, yeah. you know, I mean, growing up on social media is just radically different from the way I grew up. So okay. I am I am concerned as you are. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. That's a big admission. I'm sure your listeners will be sorry well, to hear no, that. You can find, even concerned. in my piece, you can you can find me admitting that I'm kind of straining to be slightly yeah. less pessimistic than you. Um, there's one other thing I'd say about my worldview, but I don't want to get into it. I don't want to, I don't want to monopolize this. Um, I would just say that, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned. And the other thing you brought up uh, was uh, just the status of our democracy and whether it was designed for this information environment. Now, you know, a theme in my reply to you is kind of that <laughs> to remind people, I'm sure you knew this, but uh, that, you know, this stuff isn't brand, brand new. Uh, and and these these things take have taken a uh, some of these are the culmination of long building forces, and the point about democracy is a good one. When I was, uh, I mean, I mean that's a good example. Um, w when I was uh, at a magazine called The Sciences in the early '80s, I wrote a piece called "Democracy's Impending Demise," and I made exactly the point that our democracy was designed. In a, in a particular mm -hmm. technological era. And the idea was to insulate the deliberative process mm -hmm. from the winds of public opinion. Uh, that was no longer happening. I quoted my Madison in that. I recycled the piece as a cover story in time, like 10 or 15 years later, called Hyper Democracy. Um, and, and originally, I was talking about things like computerized mass mail, right? Which, which mm -hmm. really helped uh, crystallize interest groups and kind of, you know, right. Right. overnight polls and things. So, I wouldn't, you know, you you put a lot of emphasis on social media per se. Yes. And I would just say that I, I think the challenges are about as big as you characterize them as being. But I think, you know, the, the forces that have gotten us here have been building for a, lo a long time. Right. Okay. So I'd like to reply to that. And I'd like to agree in most ways, except for one really big way. So I did have a paragraph in the Atlantic essay where I say, of course, our polarization goes back before social media. There are all kinds of other factors, and I should have listed even more. So in some ways, we've been here before. And of course, we were very polarized in the 1850s and 60s. And of course, 1968, around that period, there was a lot of violence, uh, a, lot, a lot more political violence than there is today. So in many ways, uh, we've been here before. And in many ways, the roots of where we are go back well before uh, I focused not on the origin of social media in 2004, when most of the platforms come out, but in 2009, when Facebook adds the like button, Twitter adds the retweet button, and things become just much more viralized. Uh, before 2009, you could put up any crazy conspiracy you wanted, but it wasn't going to reach millions of people within 24 hours. There was no way to do that. Yeah. And after 2009, with the retweet button especially, now things can go global within a day or two. Um, so I would agree with you that in many ways we've been here before, but I think that there's something new. Um, and, and this is where I urge people, don't just be a cognitive psychologist. Almost all of this discussion is about cognitive psychology. It's about information and information technologies. And we're drowning in information. And maybe is it good information? Is it bad information? Everyone's focusing on the information. And I'm not that interested in the information. I'm a social psychologist. I'm interested in social interaction, social relationships. And even though, of course, our, our polarization, a lot of it is due to uh, cable TV. The three, having three television networks was an historical mm -hmm. anomaly, which was the age of mass media. We all had the same news, and it was, that wasn't the case in the 18th and 19th century, and it will never again be the case in, in, for the rest of humanity, or at least in the next 100 years. Um, 
So if you focus just on information, you'd say, well, that was a temporary period. Uh, and now, of course, there are more information sources, but that's just like it was in the 18th and 19th centuries. No, what I want to say is um, none of these older technologies made us afraid of the person sitting next to us. What changed in 2014, 2015 is that for the first time, professors became afraid of their own students. I shouldn't say first time. Though, of course, that's happened before in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. There are times when professors feared their students. A little of but, that in the late 60s in America, I would yes, say. Yes, you're right. Okay. I mean, I, Thank I, you. you're I, right about that. I once met a guy who was a dean at Columbia and a student walked in and shot him. He lived, apparently, because I was okay. talking to him, but, but uh, it, there was some of that. There was yeah, some no, of that. You, you are right. There was, there was what? You can, say it was, you can say it was just student radicalism. In the, in, of course, and that was in France, it was in China, it was in America. So no, you're right, there are previous periods. But, where, but now what changed in 2014, 2015 is our, most of our students are still perfectly reasonable, curious. Surveys show that they believe in free speech, they want to learn. The average student hasn't changed. What's changed is the dynamics where it used to be if I was lecturing to a room of 300 students, say at UVA when I was teaching intro psych, I could be provocative. And, uh, and I had to pass the reasonable person standard. That is, I could do things that would make students uncomfortable and then I'd resolve the discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, I could walk them through a, a whole thing that I planned out very carefully and it was emotionally involving. Uh, and as long as what I was doing was reasonable, if three out of 300 students were offended or they didn't like what I was doing, that was considered okay. Like you can't please every single person, there are misunderstandings. But what happened after 2014, 2015 is if a single student is upset, they now have mechanisms to report you, to demand that you be punished or denounced or renounced. Um, and that began to happen um, to professors. Uh, and we, we started having to teach to the most sensitive students. This is when Greg Lukianoff came to me and said, John, weird stuff is happening. Some students are demanding protections from speech. So, so at first we thought this was just in universities. And without Twitter and other social media platforms, this wouldn't have happened. Um, students could, of course, they could always go talk to the dean uh, directly, but they're not going to do that. If they can press a button, do something privately, you know, uh, uh, that's what they would do. Um, that was in universities, 2014, 2015, it starts. 2018, 2019, now it spreads out into the corporate world. And I just hear story after story. You know, I, I talk to, uh, I talk to uh, you know, senior people at the New York Times or, you know, uh, columnists, and editors, uh, and they tell me the same thing. People, everyone there is on the left, but they're afraid of, like, the junior copy editor or the, you know, the, you know a young person in publicity who has the power to, you know, say something on the Slack channel that causes a blow up. Everyone's walking on eggshells. Cable TV didn't do that. Cable TV changed the information flow. It didn't change our relationships with the people in our company, our university, our classroom. Social media has made us afraid in a way that no previous technology has. At least that's what I say. You, am I wrong about that? Well, first of all, you are on a college campus, so you're more aware of the way things are at kind of the epicenter of that. And you're an elite at an elite university. Um, you, you know, I've given talks at, at less elite universities where there really wasn't any yeah. of this stuff. That's right. And, 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 uh, and now elite universities are, are disproportionately influential, I'm sure. Um, I, but I would also say it's relatively early days, right? I mean, okay. adjustments True. get made. I, I've seen a change in that. I have seen more progressives willing to, you know, online call out what, they see as totally gratuitous speech policing than I saw five years ago or so. Um, so I don't know, you know, where this is. I don't know where this is going. Um, the other thing is, it isn't. It, it of course isn't just technology. I mean, America is becoming more ethnically diverse. Uh, there is, you know, there uh, more, you know, kind of gender slash sexual identities are mm -hmm. recognized, some of which have been kind of in the closet and it's good that they don't have to be anymore. Mm -hmm. And all of these things are challenging, you know? Um, I mean, I remember the, the, the Yale, uh, one of the, the big, you know, incidents at Yale that uh, put this, this whole issue on the radar screen about the memo about the Halloween party. Mm -hmm. And I remember yes. kind of being ambivalent. I remember thinking, well, the memo the university had sent out was, to remind, one of the things I think it said was, you know, remember when you choose your costume, there are people here who, who are Native Americans. So like mm -hmm. dressing up as a Native American 
is going to hit them very differently like uh, mm -hmm. than it would hit you. I didn't think that was a crazy thing to remind people of. You know, there are people mm -hmm. who come to Yale from all over and, and some of them just may not be yeah, aware. Now, some fine. of them may hear that and go, well, who cares? It's their problem. But mm -hmm. some of them may go, well, you know, now that I'm aware of that, yeah, why dress up as like an Indian, you know? Um, yeah. So the, the original memo is fine, but then... Erica Christakis, who studies early childhood and who's been really seeing how kids no longer have any independence. Kids are told, do this, don't do this. They're mm -hmm. guided all the way through college. So this is what she is studying. And this is basically what the coddling the American mind was about. We really messed up childhood by taking away childhood independence beginning in the 90s. So you're right. The original memo wasn't crazy. Erica's response wasn't crazy. And so Yale students in 2015 should be able to have a discussion. What yeah. do you think? But that's no, not what that. happened. Yeah. That is not what happened. No, people were shouting her down and things. and, and uh, well, they, were, they were shouting her husband down, demanding that he apologize for that, he renounced her. Uh, right. So that was a, so this was really the first big national event. This was sort of the coming out party for the new morality. Um, so I don't know. I don't feel that as closely as you do. I, I'm certainly, I, I mean, look, identity politics is very much in the air, obviously, or what is called by some identity politics and not by others. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, Sometimes the the discourse is exceedingly edgy. I I, I would you know I would say, uh, but but I'll tell you one, one difference between you and me is I actually remember the late sixties. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. it was wild. Mm -hmm. I was living yeah. in San Francisco I when I was like twelve, thirteen years old, uh, and it was wild. Uh, and you know, like uh, my father was an army officer, and he's like driving down the highway in an identifiably an army vehicle, and. Mm -hmm. You know, people drive alongside him and are cursing at him and flipping him off mm -hmm. and stuff. That's not civil discourse. Yeah, uh, that's right. But there, but there was a war. There was an unjust, obviously unjust, or at least it seems so, a war going on that was drafting young men. There were new drugs and ideas in the mix. So I don't think the 60s was because of a new technology. Um, I think it was because of new, well, because of an extraordinary time. That's kind of my uh, point, though. The this, this isn't all about technology. And and, okay. and the political roots of things can kind of come and go. Mm -hmm. but uh, and, and we can make the adaptations and, and so yeah. on. But go ahead. Sorry. Okay. But no, but let's, let, me, let me just think about this. Um, the, let's see. Okay. So, uh, you know, there were enormous civil protests in the 1960s. Uh, about race issues, about civil rights, and about the war. Those were two giant issues um, where, at least from the vantage point of history, it looks like there were incredible injustices being done and young people rose up to oppose them. Mm -hmm. I've recently been playing with a, a sort of a thought experiment to, to put this in perspective. Let me try this out on you. Um, so I was, born in, I was born in October of 1963, which is two months after Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech, mm -hmm. which means that I was born... 100 years and two months after the Emancipation Proclamation. And if we look at America and how much progress America made on, on racial justice from 1863 to 1963, the answer has got to be not very much, certainly not a century's worth of progress. Okay? And then now let's look at my lifetime. From 1963, let's go up to 2013, the next 50 years, when I turned 50 in, 1960, mm -hmm. in, in, in 2013. How much progress do we make there? Well, on, on civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, animal rights, environmental consciousness, on any issue you could name that progressives should care about, that, that if any rights for any group, anybody you could name, it's the most extraordinary progress, I would guess, of any country in human history, a complete rights revolution. Um, so whatever it is that we were doing was working. You go to 2013, Barack Obama has just won re-election um, in, in November 2012. A lot of gay marriage bills passed. They had failed in 2008, but a lot of them passed in 2018. And of course, a couple of years later, it's going to be, the Supreme Court's going to say it's the law of the land. So, you know, so I often hear people say like, oh, the students today, you know, of course they're angry. There's so much injustice. But I say, wait a second now. In the 100 years before I was born, there was hardly any progress. In the 50 years of my life, there's been the most extraordinary progress in history. And so in 2013, you should be saying, wow. Wow, America, we did it. And whatever it is we're doing, let's keep doing it. What you should not do is say, oh my God, there's been no progress. What we're doing is terrible. Everything is white supremacy. Yale is white supremacy. We need to tear everything down and start again. But, and if we had not had social media, we would have kept going. We would have continued, I think. But you because think of social media, social media, and here I'm drawing on Martin Gurry, 
who says, uh, distributed networks are very good at tearing down, but they're not good at building. And social media, Twitter in particular, but also Slack and to a lesser extent, Facebook and other platforms, um, they're very good at critiquing. Everyone's a critic. Everyone complains. They're very good at tearing down, but they're not very good at building. And I would ask you know, people who say, well, of course, the students are right to be protesting. I would ask them, in 2013, which is the group that was being marginalized? What group was not welcome on campus? Who was excluded and a victim of extraordinary prejudice in 2013? You know, you can't point back to 1950 and say, see, America is terrible and we need to burn everything down. Tell me who was excluded in 2013 but I think, that we couldn't bring in. I think part of this, uh, though, I think part of the impetus for this grows out of frustration, implicitly at least, that the revolution has not translated more into material equality. And, and you know, in terms of income levels, wealth levels, mm -hmm. living conditions, and so on. Now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you and I may think, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, look, my, my own political preference is for a as, a, as a progressive, this is the way I think of myself, is for fundamentally a class-based politics, okay? Yeah, I agree like, with that. Like, come up with material benefits for mm -hmm. low-income people. If we have a problem in that some ethnicities are more concentrated at lower incomes, which we do, those policies mm -hmm. will disproportionately yeah. help those people, and 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 so on. That happens to be my uh, my bias. Yeah, that's 20th, 20th century empirically minded uh, progressivism. That's my well, bias. Well, it's too. also far left. It's also there's an interesting irony that some in some parts of the far left you have you have a certain like Glenn Greenwald is is kind of you know uh, is is kind of pushing back against identity politics. He would probably call himself a socialist. Okay. Now, um, so class based politics you know is favored mm -hmm. in a number of places to. Uh, to the left of center. Now, you and I may think that there's an irony. I do think there's an irony, which is that a lot of the political discourse that dominates kind of Democratic Party politics succeeds in helping basically a small number of elites from ethnic minorities, mm -hmm. right? Like they are going to get the job at MSNBC yeah. and they get this and they get that. And we're not we're not doing a lot uh, to to help the George Floyds of the world in the mm -hmm. sense of keeping them from winding up in the situation he found himself in in the first place, which okay. is, you know, with a, with a, a life that was, he, was in, he was in trouble to begin with. He, he, there was a reason there were cops there, you know, and so on. And so, you know, and there's an argument going on now on left of center. And it's not clear to me that uh, the forces you're worried about prevailing are going to prevail. Um, and I, I don't know. This is. Uh, but in any event, I also think it isn't, I don't think it's just technology. There have been a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been listening to a book about the Russian Revolution. Things got pretty intense then, as you may oh, know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. so oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so, um, okay, so let's see, there's a lot, of, a lot of threads we could go on here. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's the one that I'm going to go on. The central idea of my article, it's not just, oh, you know, social media is destroying everything. It's, I'm, I'm really trying to get down into the mechanism by which people interact that leads to truth. So here I'm drawing on uh, Jonathan Rauch's incredible book, The Constitution of Knowledge. Rauch talks about how um, the, the liberal tradition in the West created universities and journalism and courts, uh, a jury system where you've got adversarial attorneys trying to present both sides. Um, and in this way, because you, you can't get rid of confirmation bias, all you can do is harness it so that people have different confirmation biases, they cancel out. And that's, you know, if a legislature is working well, that's what happens. You need people on the left, on the right, they criticize each other. And uh, Rauch says, these, these institutions are, are machines for, for turning difference into better policy, something like that. Mm -hmm. They need difference. They need, but it has to be managed conflict. That's a key term, managed conflict. Um, so if Congress were properly constituted so that there was debate, that would manage conflict. If you give everybody knives or flamethrowers and all they do is kill each other, well, then that's not managed conflict. Um, now, to bring it back to what you said about um, right now, yes, there's been enormous progress in equality on the books. There's been enormous progress in equality before the law. There has not been as much progress on equality by outcomes. Um, on gender, there's actually been quite a lot, but not but far from perfect. If, if we just look at outcomes, men, of course, still make more money. 
older men. In the 20s, it's actually pretty much the same because young men are doing so badly and they're not finishing college. So actually, in the 20s, it's actually pretty much a parody. But overall, older men still make more than older women. Um, th these disparities are complicated and social scientists have been studying them intensively since the 60s at least. The major topic of research in the social sciences, in terms of at least applied social science, is addressing inequalities by race and gender and, and other, other areas. Um, <clears throat> and if you get a bunch of experts in the room who've spent their lives studying this and get them to look at all the data of what has been tried, what worked, and I did this. I was part of a group convened by um, AEI and Brookings. We had a bunch of experts on policy. I was the moderator just because I studied left-right stuff. Um, and we, we, we did, an, I think, an amazing job bringing people together to debate, like, okay, what actually is the data on poverty in America? And it was hard to do, but we created a report. And we all, you know, and they knew everyone that Hillary was going to appoint um, for, to handle domestic policy. And we were all ready to go when Hillary took over to give her the report, say, Here is, here's the best social science on how to, how to reduce, especially childhood poverty. That was our focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if, you, if you have experts come up with policies, what percent will be affected? Very hard to say, but it's probably not over 50%. These are incredibly hard problems to solve. If you have experts with PhDs who really care and want to solve the problem, these are very hard problems to solve. If you don't have that, if instead you have young people uh, demanding change, protesting this, demanding a policy that has been shown to backfire, uh, and putting pressure on schools and companies to implement these policies that have been shown to backfire, I think that's even less likely to help. Mm. And the point of my article was that Social media, it's like it passed out dart guns to everyone. Um, everyone can intimidate anyone. Everyone can attack anyone. You can do it anonymously. Um, some people get paid by the dart. That is, some people, the more they you know, it, it, uh, attack people publicly, the more praise they get, the more followers they get. Um, so you don't get the sort of the John Stuart Mill or the Jonathan Rauch dynamic of managed conflict. That kind of ended around 2014, 2015. Not, I'm exact, it didn't end, but, it, but there's a lot less of it. Even in university discussions, if we're discussing anything about welfare policy, child poverty, uh, there's just, there's just, we can't talk about the whole problem. We have to just stay within very prescribed channels. And this is true about any politically controversial topic. And that means that we are further away from solving them than, they, than we were in 2014, I would say, or 2013. Um, because back then you could at least have discussions. Now you can't have discussions. I don't think protest was certainly right to try to convince voters to or try to convince legislatures to change, police departments to change. Um, but if you can't even diagnose the problem, you know, protesters are just shooting cannons randomly. They're loose cannons. Yeah, I mean, I would just say again, you know, pendulums swing, and I've seen them swing a few times. So I, I wouldn't do too much in the way of extrapolation okay. from where we Fair are. Point. And, you know, one reason in my, in my piece uh, about your piece, I went, I went back and looked at Martin Luther and, and I and I unearthed some things mm -hmm. that weren't in my book. I mean, I talked about the printing press in the book Non-Zero, but in the Non-Zero newsletter, um, I, I went back and looked at a biography of Martin Luther and really found him using all the social media tricks. You know, you push people's emo emotional button, uh, you're, you know, you're willing to antagonize people and make enemies because notoriety is good. You know, you demonize the leader of the other tribe. You're willing to exaggerate because uh, that's the way you get your memes spread and on and on and on. Um, and again, it, it look, it took a while for equilibration to take place, but uh, you know, maybe, maybe just as the problem has materialized more rapidly, I think, than in olden times, because technology is moving faster, maybe uh, the equilibration will will happen faster as well. There's one thing you you said that I want to uh, maybe take issue with. You said, look, we can't you can't overcome confirmation bias. You have to harness it. I personally, and here, this maybe is because my diagnosis is in some ways even more grave than yours. I'm not sure we can we can get out of the mess we're in. I mean, the mess construed broadly to include all of the polarization and the and the rampant politics. kind of psychology of tribalism and 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 uh, and so on uh, without people becoming more aware of the way the human mind works more and their own mind works more aware when they're on social media of the way cognitive bias uh, confirmation bias and other cognitive biases are kicking in 
And I think a, a big question in, in any attempt to do that, to get people to do what you might call kind of psychological reform or mm -hmm. something, um, although I think at some point it, there's almost a continuum between what I'm talking about and what you call spiritual reform, because I do think it's a, it's 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 something kind of profound that involves your, uh, you know, in a way, getting out of yourself fundamentally, uh, and, um, and and kind of almost breaking down the the bounds of self. But I think a big question is, to what extent? Does what we need to do to solve the social problem you're talking about coincide with things people can do, will be incentivized to do as a matter of self-help, right? In other words, you know, people are unhappy yeah. with social media. Like, like they'll tell you, a lot of them are like, yeah, you know, I stayed off of Twitter, I felt better or whatever. Yeah. And it, it, the, the key, I think, to, to get people to start paying more attention to confirmation bias, to make them work harder to understand the other person's perspective, which is just a huge hobby horse of mine. Uh, just, mm -hmm. just cognitive empathy, yeah. not emotional empathy necessarily, just understanding the perspective of the enemy tribe. Um, if you wanna get people to do the work it takes, I think it really helps to be able to argue that they'll actually be happier if they do it. And so that's what I mean when I say a big question is to what extent uh, can a kind of uh, social improvement project coincide with the self-help project? Yeah, in theory it could, but I'm much more dubious than you because, again, as a social psychologist, I think our social needs, our social desires trump everything else. And so if you said to people, if you do choice A, you'll be happier, but if you do choice B, you'll be more popular, people will think better, you have a better reputation, you'll have more prestige you know, people are going to generally do choice B. Now, that might not be everybody. Um, but, you know, if you tell people, if you eat this food, it's bad for you, even though it tastes really delicious, that's not going to do very much. Uh, our, our, our animal desires, our hunger is very hard for us to contend with. So in my book, The Happiness Hypothesis, I use the analogy that the human mind is divided like a rider on an elephant, where the riders are conscious reasoning. The elephant is the other 99% of what's going on. And the rider's job, actually, the rider's not in control. The rider's actually there to kind of help out the elephant. The rider can't make the elephant do things it doesn't want to do. So I don't think that information is enough. I don't think that knowing the effects of this is enough. I think we have to somehow find ways to change the incentives so that uh, people don't feel trapped onto it. Like, for example, the sixth and seventh graders who are underage, they're not supposed to be on Instagram, but because everybody else is, they're on it. And a lot of them know that it's bad for them and it's stupid and it wastes time and it's got, but if anyone backs out, well, you know, it's a commons dilemma where anyone who backs out is now isolated. So um, I, I think information is not nearly enough. Uh, we need architectural changes. We need regulation, especially for underage, especially for those under 18, we need regulation so that the platforms can't just hook them and trick them and keep them on. Um, and, um, but, but on the other hand, on the other hand, for us to have those reforms, for us to have a social, a society-wide movement, as we did against drunk driving, um, as we've done against junk food, as we've done against a bunch of things, we can make progress. We do need scientifically backed information that's reliable. And then over time, it kind of seeps into policy and to people's consciousness. So there, if I can put in a plug um, for um, a program that I co-developed called Open Mind, if listeners go to openmindplatform.org, um, Caroline Mell and I created this originally within Heterodox Academy as a, as a project to sort of teach basic moral psychology and then teach basically what you just said, cognitive empathy. If you want to actually persuade people or get along with them, try looking at it from their point of view. And mm -hmm. here's why that's hard to do. And here's why liberals and conservatives disagree. So I guess I do agree with you that this is necessary, but I think it's far from sufficient uh, because social forces are more powerful. Um, but I, but yes, I, 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 I do think that social skills and the ability to live and work in a politically and morally diverse environment is going to be one of the superpowers of the 21st century. And unfortunately, I think, you know, us older people don't have it so well, although younger people have it even less. They, they've been raised in an environment where they're able to say like, nope, you know, block that, cancel that, unsubscribe from that. I shouldn't have to work next to somebody who voted for Donald Trump, for example. Mm -hmm. The... Um I mean, I certainly agree. Uh, nothing is sufficient. We need to work all yeah. the, you know, all the angles, including regulation where, you know, that's 
makes sense, doesn't infringe on the First Amendment and so on. Um, but I would I, I don't agree that like the you know, the, the uh, I like the writer and the elephant metaphor, but I don't agree that like the degree of our consciousness of the kind of internal and subtle workings of our mind is like fixed is like set in stone. You can become more aware. I mean, I'm a big advocate of mindfulness meditation. Mm, and, you know, mm -hmm. if you've gone on like a serious, like, you know, one week silent meditation retreat, you probably know what I mean when I say you can become exquisitely aware of how subtly emotions influence and shape thoughts and how without realizing it, how emotionally reactive you are to ideas, to people, and how those in turn shape your thoughts. So I think I think self-awareness is more self-awareness is just in principle possible. Now, as for incentivizing people to do that, uh, mindfulness meditation is actually a good idea because it, it has a kind of therapeutic value. There is a yeah. self-help angle. But, but on a somewhat separate level, I would also just say that, you know, norms change. What's cool changes. And it's not easy to change norms in a kind of purposeful way it's not like just just uh dialing the knob up or, mm -hmm. or anything but i can imagine a world in which people who egregiously misrepresent the other tribe for example or or, or just take uh you know the craziest trumpets there is and and act as if they are typical mm -hmm. or you know commits any any of the the other you know uh what I consider to be, uh, you know, errors of kind of interpretation and and presentation on social media that that get people riled up for no good reason and actually impede cognitive empathy. I can imagine a world where people are shamed for doing that. Okay, and and and, and I've seen a little of it around the edges. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you you see, yeah. uh, I think Matt Iglesias is a good example because in the in the early, uh, you know, around the George Floyd protests. That was when suddenly, you know, some of the things that, that you in particular, I think, are, are objecting to became very prominent and some yes. were almost new. And it took a kind of a, a courage to state how you felt about them online. Like, I remember a video of some, you know, some protesters. Uh, there were outdoor diners. You probably remember mm -hmm. this. It oh, was yes. in Washington. They and they the walked diners, up yeah. and basically demanded that they raise their hands to yeah. signify their support for this yeah. supposedly progressive cause. Whereas I just consider that so abhorrent, the idea of coercing anyone into yeah. signifying. That's right. It was an illiberal, kind of that's right. and, it had know, illiberal elements. It was, um, it, it, at first, you know, people, I, I think, I, I just want to say, I think there are, there's a set of people who qualify as progressives who are more willing to condemn stuff like that than they were a few years ago. I, I think, things uh things can change and uh that needs to change our norms need okay. to change what qualifies as cool on social media needs to change okay so i i agree with uh, of all of what you just said i'll just qualify a couple of things first on uh, yes mindfulness works because it is training the elephant mindfulness meditation you can't really get the benefits from it in a day or a week but yes over time you develop mental habits Meditation has an effect. You become a better meditator. You become more disciplined at it. So there are techniques, and it's it's quite amazing the way that all, many cultures have developed techniques of daily practice, daily training that retrain the elephant over time. Stoic practices, I think, are also very powerful. So in the happiness hypothesis, I found that the Stoics and the Buddhists were the two most concentrated areas of, of, of wisdom, of psychological wisdom. I love them both. Um, as for norms changing, um, I do agree there is some. You know, there's a there are pendulums and you know, I think there was there was so much passion in the wake of George Floyd, and this was also COVID. This was also Donald Trump being his mm -hmm. Trumpiest, jerkiest, most aggressive, right. nasty self. So, 2020 was an extreme year, like 1968, and in some ways, yes, uh, there is some movement back. Just for example, I've heard from you know, I've heard, I've heard several people tell me that the New York Times has has re the leadership has actually really pulled back from some of the things that it did. They, I think they regret some of the things that they did. Um, uh, and they are rec they recognize that they've damaged their credibility. Um, they need to stand up for journalistic, uh, that for the journalistic profession and journalistic integrity. So they are pushing back. They actually came out, you know, they they had a whole uh, ed uh, editorial essay on the importance of free speech 
which of course they got slaughtered for online because, you know, well, whatever. Uh, but they did actually make an argument in favor of free speech. And so that was very brave of them in this day and age, I suppose. So yes, there is some, some restoration, some movement back away from the peak passions of 2020. Uh, now, I think a lot of us were hoping that when Donald Trump left, things would go back to some semblance of normal. I did not expect that because I saw all these trends, and Greg and I wrote about this before Donald Trump was a candidate. Um, so uh, Donald Trump masked things and COVID masked things, but in a lot of ways, the trends we're seeing were happening before Trump. They made Trump possible. Trump was a complete jerk, and, and, and you know the way he behaved, the things he said, these would have been disqualifying 10 years earlier. Um, now, as for your hope that sometime, like totally misrepresenting your enemies is going to become somehow not cool, or you know, some of these out, outrageous techniques is going to be a source of shame. If there was a shared framework, if there was a sense of how we do things, if there was a shared culture, that could happen. But my argument is in the post babel world, there is no shared culture and there will not be a shared culture for the rest of our lives. I can't say what's going to happen in 200 years, but I will predict that 20 or 30 years, there will not be a shared culture, a common sense, a, a, a common understanding you know, if, if we're attacked, if there's a terrorist attack, if something happens, I, I don't think there'll be a common understanding of what has happened to us. I think it's babble from here on in, at least for the next several decades. What do mm -hmm. you think about that? Well, let me say, first of all, let me say, I don't think I finished, I, I threw Matt Iglesias' name out there. The point was just that he's somebody who I think qualifies as left of center, who oh, yeah. is willing to condemn some of uh, what he considers yes. the excess. And, and you know, he's, he's an, an influential thinker. figure, and, and this is yeah. the way norms change. But, but... Okay. Um, uh, to your point, um, well, as for the Trump years, I, there, there is a there's an analytical point I, I signaled early on, said I'd get back to, and this is uh, probably the opportunity, the, 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 because it very much speaks to the Trump phenomenon. The, the, the point was that, uh, you know, information technologies are naturally uh, fragmenting. At, I mean. Evolutions of information technology can be naturally fragmenting if they make it, if they lower the cost of communication and, and they're powerful, they can just make it practical for smaller tribes to form. Yes. Very mm -hmm. small hobby groups, interest groups can form. But but that that doesn't necessarily signal infinite fragmentation because those things can form across very long distances. So you mm -hmm. can get a kind of long distance um, oh, coherence. Yeah. Oh, like and, the Buffalo shooter. I mean, the, the world of young men who, who right. kill, kill foreigners that they all share, they're part of a community. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, that's bad because they are, uh, they're violent, um, you know, they're, they're violent people with an abhorrent ideology. But it can happen. I mean, let me preface this by saying, you said, I'm not sure cultural will ever be unified again. How many times has it been? I mean, you happen oh. to have grown up right when broadcast yeah. Yeah. TV hit. You go back 30, 40, 50 years earlier, there was less unity of American culture. Mm -hmm. And being in the working class was radically different from being in the yeah. upper class in terms of what you read, what you saw. We, so, so it's not like this is the human norm, you know, post-industrialization to have a unified culture. We had one for a while. I agree mm -hmm. it's never going to be uh, quite like that again. The question is, can society be uh, stable and have the fundamental features yeah. we would like in terms right. of justice and, and, yeah. and, and some degree That's of right. equality? And I suspect, of, yeah. yeah. And I suspect that the answer is no. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I just read, uh, Yasha Monk has this incredible book, The Great Experiment. Uh, I forget what the subtitle is, but is the point is, so Yasha, so Yasha is looking at the question of, of, of immigration, diversity, how do you have a, a, a good democracy? And he points out that history does have many examples of diverse societies. None of them are democracies. Because if you have an emperor and, you know, or a king, he guarantees the safety of the Jews and the Croats and the, you know, all the different ethnic groups are safe under the emperor. And history does have some examples of democracy, you know, in the New World and, and Europe and many places, uh, but none of them are diverse. Um, if you have the sense of we're all the same, then you can have much more a game of there, but for the grace of God go I, we are interchangeable, we can have social welfare policies like in Scandinavia, uh, because, you know, we, we all have a social contract. 
Uh, and so Yashi is wrestling with the question, which several social scientists have wrestled with before, um, about what happens as you increase diversity. And I think in the late 20th century, we could increase diversity and we got a lot of benefits from it because there was, I think you need to always look at the centripetal forces pulling a culture together and the centrifugal forces blowing it out. And mm -hmm. there was a temporary period, as you say, a temporary period where mass media was a centripetal force. And with that centripetal force, we could handle a, a, a lot of immigration, but it was also immigration with, with, um, uh, with assimilation. So, you know, so I'm, I'm Jewish. My grandparents were born in Russia and Poland and Belarus. And so for, for Jews, my wife is Korean. Um, you know, her, her parents came over, her dad came over in the 50s. For a lot of immigrants in the 20th century, assimilation was fantastic. And it really opened the doors to, to success, to you didn't have to give up everything. You could still be Jewish or Korean or whatever you wanted to be. Um, so there's a set of discussions we had around diversity and assimilation in the 20th century against the backdrop of a very strong centripetal force for media. And then pretty quickly in the 21st century, it begins in the 90s with cable TV, media overall becomes now a fragmenting force. It becomes a centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. And whatever we thought about other things, um, those, we have to rethink all those now. And that's what Yash mm -hmm. is trying to do in his book. And I think it's going to be very, very hard. And it's especially hard because it's very hard to talk about. We can't, it's very hard to have open discussions about these topics because you'll be, you'll be shot by darts. You'll be accused of things. Um, you mean so if you I'm, think I'm, immigration should be restricted because it's impractical? Yeah, or, more, or I think more to the point, if you think assimilation is a good thing. If you think, yeah, you mm. know, we can have immigration, but we should have assimilation. We should have a sense that we're all Americans, we're all one. Uh, now, you know, there's some I'm academic sure context where I can say that. I mean, that, that's the kind well, of I thing say, where I, I wouldn't I would say that wait. on Twitter. I would wait and see where the pendulum goes. I, I don't. I don't consider that that an idea that's uh, never going to be presentable again, or even isn't presentable yeah. okay, now. You get a lot of blowback. Fun. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, and and there are things, you know, like cultural appropriation where you get a lot of blowback. But I'm just not mm -hmm. sure that's going to stick. I, where you know the the, the the kind of some of the uh anyway let, let me i there's one thing i want to there's, there's a thought i want to finish because it, it gets this analytical point i said i wanted to make so back to my book non-zero the culmination of non-zero was an argument that uh more and more the world's nations faced non-zero sum problems in other words they're going to be either win win or lose lose uh such that the logical thing to do was cooperate Climate change, obvious one, all kinds of, you know, arms races, nuclear weapons in space, bioweapons and so on. I think, you know, pandemics uh, and so on. Uh, and the argument was we're going to have to have more in the way of international governance for certain things, especially these weapons problems and so on. And so, you know, part of that, and including economic things, like I can imagine a day uh, where um, labor issues are meaningfully addressed at the level of the World Trade Organization, or certainly at the level of like NAFTA, a smaller international trade uh, regime. And so, you know, if that happens, you are going to see a kind of international fragmentation that is internationally coherent, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Bannon, an example of this is like, Steve Bannon was trying to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, create a, ne a European network right. of ethno-nationalists. Oh, far-right organizations. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, there's a version of that that I can imagine being healthy. What I mean by that is the people Trump represents deserved better than Trump, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. They have yes. actual issues. They yes. were adversely affected to some extent right. by like international trade. Yeah, even absolutely. if I, th I think that was exaggerated, but also, and more of it was from technology. But anyway, they have legit grievances, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so if you if you if we refer to their kind of legitimate grievances as something other than just far right, okay, just mm -hmm. just yeah. coalition X. That's a label. Yeah, right. It 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 it, it makes you know without the Trump craziness and without the mm -hmm. you know the the Tucker Carlson opportunism and all that. If you yeah. just look at legit political issues, they had a right to raise about the distribution of income and all and a lot a, a lot of issues that should be appealing to people on the left, right? Mm -hmm. And and if, if you look at those, I can imagine an international uh, organ, you know, I can imagine them doing more and more in the way of connecting internationally with people who share their issues, 
Certainly within the European Union, you already have the mechanisms of governance and regulation where things are addressed internationally. So you would expect them to unite uh, in that way, you know. And, and, and by the way, one of their grievances that uh, elite Americans feel more of a commonality with elites in Europe than with uh, low income Americans, Europe. that's true, probably. Yeah, and you're right. probably inevitably going to see some of that. So I'm just saying there, there is a scenario in which some of, some of the intranational fragmentation is internationally coherent and winds up leading to it, becoming part of a politics that is more international. Okay. Yeah. It's an old yeah. dream. But it's an old dream. Ask Karl it, it Marx. Is an old but dream. Anyway. It, no, that's right. It's certainly, and you know, and that certainly made sense in the nineties um, that we would someday have to um, deal with the, the, the issues you mentioned, especially climate change. And we would do that through international agreements. There would be, you know, we, we don't just have nation states. We have, you know, the EU and NAFTA. Um, but I think that dream is much further from us now than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And one of the reasons is because that you have to have some level of leadership, um, uh, the ability to act as a nation, the ability of elites or leaders to lead their nation and speak for their nation. Um, but now I don't think that's possible anymore because, for example, you know, when, you know, like just, I don't know all the details, but of course, when, when Macron tried to what, raise fuel prices or whatever you, whatever you want to do, the, if the elites in the country say we need to do this thing about whether it's be, it would be about, you know, uh, you know, changing taxes or whether it be about, about something about climate change or energy, you're now going to have, because of the fragmentation and the polarization, you're going to have part of the country rioting over that. It's going to be very hard for a leader of any country to make that, to, to lead its country, to make a deal that in any way puts sacrifice in any group, um, because we can't play a game anymore of, okay, you got harmed by this thing, but we'll pay you back in this way. Of course, that's what Bill Clinton wanted to do with NAFTA, and it didn't really work. And that was the reality. Um, in the 21st century, in the post-Babel era, there's no trust, there's no possibility of having, say, you know, working class whites trust a democratic president on anything. That's just not going to happen again in many decades. Um, so I don't think we're, you know, the, the level of paranoia, the level of animosity, the fragmentation mm -hmm. is such that, you know, it's as though we tried to build these bigger and bigger towers only to discover that the mortar holding the bricks together is now expired. There's no mm -hmm. more mortar. We can't build tall towers anymore. So that's the darkest thing. That international cooperation may have been the dream of the 90s, and the early 2000s, but its time might be over. And that, I, it's terrifying to say that because that is now sounding kind of like, you know, like a Trumpian worldview where it's just America first, America first. I don't want to live in that world, but I fear that social media might force us to live in it. Actually, ironically, Trump did some fiddling with NAFTA that uh, made some of the uh, labor protection, the wage protection provisions stronger and, and okay, got yeah. buy-in from a left-wing Mexican government. Um, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I guess... Uh, uh, my, my, my only, you know, unshakable conviction is that either we make these adaptations or the apocalypse is near. I mean, that's only a slight exaggeration. And so, um, and I can imagine the adaptation, and I mean a whole bunch of adaptation. I'm not just talking about international governance. I mean, a lot of adaptations, including mm -hmm. self-helpy, spiritual, uh, in the structure of governance. And I guess if there's a if there's something positive, I, I and then I'll give you a chance to close with something either negative or positive. But uh, that I would say is that, like, given the 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 magnitude of change and the sh technological change alone, and the short period of time it's happened in, and and uh, and I mean construed broadly, the way technology has facilitated trade and uh, and 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 everything and change the, the nature of, you know, what, what work is automated and what's not. Uh, everything, you know, from, from social media to, to, to virtual reality, um, given how fast this much has happened, it's in a certain sense not surprising that we feel profoundly mm. shaken. And, yeah. And, yeah. and, and now, if, if the change keeps accelerating in yeah. meaningful ways, yeah. maybe there's no hope, right? But uh, it could be that this is a big threshold and then we'll have a chance to settle in. Yeah, that could well be. And so, yeah, let me end on a slightly more hopeful note than I've been chiming this, this whole hour, uh, which is this. Um, so I like to think in terms of complex dynamical systems and there's like a landscape and, you know, there's like a depression and we're sort of in a depression and we want to get to a different place. 
but the hill is very high. We can't get over the hill. Um, uh, I, I believe that there is, there is a, a configuration of society in which digital technologies and social media have actually given us better democracy. Um, uh, I, I heard a, a podcast on the, uh, the human technology, uh, uh, your undivided attention with uh, somebody in, the, in, in Taiwan. Apparently Taiwan has really found ways to use the technology to have better democracy. So we are in one spot. There is a place where we have better, more representative democracy. It does a better job of meeting people's needs. Um, uh, and I don't know how high the hill is that we have to cross to get there. I don't know whether it's possible to get there. Um, I, I suspect that, I believe that it is. I suspect it is, but that it might not be possible. Um, what, I, what I say, you know, I'm, I'm very dark here, but what I'm saying is if we keep going, if the trends, if the trends that we are currently on, if they keep going, then our country will fall apart. Um, it's not possible to have a democracy with very weak institutions and very low trust and a lot of violence. So if we don't make big changes, then I think the sort of the political or social apocalypse is coming. Um, but I think that we might make big changes. And in my Atlantic article, I pointed out three buckets or categories, three things that we can do these actually will be in much better shape. And they are hardened democratic institutions so that they can survive even more polarization and political violence and, and disruption. Um, the second is reform social media so that it's less toxic to democratic and epistemic institutions. That includes identity authentication. You can still post with a pseudonym, but you have to at least show that you're a person old enough to use the platform, things like that. Changes to the architecture so it's not so hyperviral. Uh, and then the third, uh, the third big bucket of reforms is we have to prepare the next generation for citizenship in a democracy. And we've been doing exactly the opposite. We've been raising kids, preventing them from having conflicts, preventing them from having the experiences that let them grow. We're making our kids fragile and depressed. So however bad things are now, they're going to get worse as Gen Z becomes the primary generation running our politics. Uh, but if we can change that, if we can give childhood back to kids, have more free play, uh, uh, train them in, in, in skills of democratic participation. So I just like to call uh, listeners' attention to a project, letgrow.org, which I started with Lenore Skenazy, who wrote Free Range Kids. There's a lot we can do to reverse the mental health crisis. Um, open mind, open, uh, openmindplatform.org, a lot we can do to, to train the next generation how to have these skills. So there are a lot of things that we can do. And then find, those are the three buckets. But then finally, there's something I didn't really mention in my article. I wish I had. I wish I'd ended um, by saying that, you know, even though I talked about structural reforms as the things we need to do, there's a lot we can do as individuals. And you can point to some of it. I mean, people can, you know, you're going to get some blowback, but stand up for principles, stand up for other people, you know, be moderate, understand the other side. Um, so in our personal behavior, we can model the kind of citizenship that can, that can be productive in this crazy, risky, fast-moving uh, uh, democratic uh, society that we now have. So there's a lot that we can do as individuals. I didn't talk about that in the article. I wish I had. And then finally, I'm going to end with the, the, the greatest line that I found that I, I again, I wish I'd worked in. Um, there's, a, there's a line from Joseph Campbell, the, the, mytho the great mythologist, the man who studied mm -hmm. myth in the, in the late 20th century. Um, and after studying you know, the hero's journey, he studied uh, uh, you know, heroic myths from all around the world. Um, and he gives us what I think is really a guide for how to live in this crazy era. Um, you know, I read about all this dark stuff, but I'm not actually depressed. I feel like I'm very engaged, um, even though I think cognitively, oh my God, we're in big trouble here. Um, and what I'm sort of, what I want to, do, what I want to aim for is what Joseph Campbell says. He's got this line. He says, um, that the, the lesson from mythology, the lesson from ancient cultures, the lesson from the hero's stories are, is this, quote, participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world. We cannot cure the world of sorrows, but we can choose to live in joy. The warrior's approach is to say yes to life, yea to it all, end quote. So that is that's my aspiration now, and I hope that'll be of some comfort after this relatively dark conversation between the okay. two of us. And my advice is buy low, sell high. So <laughs> I wish I had done that. I keep getting it reversed. <laughs> um, no, that's good advice from, uh, from, from Joseph Campbell. I'll subscribe to that. Uh, so thank you, John. Uh, everybody should check out your Atlantic piece. Um, and what's your Twitter handle? Is it, uh, John Height, at John Height. H-A-I-D-T. Um, Yep. J -O -N -H -A -I -D -T. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and just one, just one final plug, if I may. If anybody here is a professor or an administrator at a university, 
please come join Heterodox Academy. Go to heterodoxacademy.org. We are all about that John Stuart Mill process of bringing viewpoint diversity, managed mm-hmm. conflict into universities where it belongs and where we need it. But if you're orthodox, don't. Heterodox, right? You do. You That's said right. any professor. You don't mean any professor. Yes, we do. You mean heterodox we professors. No, we could, we're happy to have orthodox professors. They would bring wow, some viewpoint diversity. Heterodox. We don't want to all be heterodox. I see. Okay. Uh, so you're pro-diversity. Good. All right. Well, thanks, John. Let's. Uh, there's plenty left to talk about, so maybe we'll do this another time. But uh, thanks for covering so much, Brown. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul.